Jesus is King. It's great to be back on. Happy Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe a few, day, a few days ago. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I have a surprise for you. I don't know if you know this. Um, I didn't tell you this. So um, if you've been over to my website lately, I don't know if you, you've been there, but you'll see that I'm um, I'm teaching some classes for homeschool students starting in the fall. Oh, starting in the summer, I'm going to have some classes for, for homeschool students, right? And um, in 2023, in the fall of 2023, I'm teaching this class called, and I'm rolling out these classes, like 12 classes, but I'm rolling them out, you know, not all at one time. So in the fall of 2023, I'm offering a new class that semester called The Catholic Citizen and Catholic social teaching or Catholic, uh, yeah, Catholic social teaching in the Catholic citizen. And so one of my texts for the class required text is the city of God versus the city of man. I'm that impressed with your book. And I think is I think it's going to make an awesome textbook. And um, hopefully you'll be able to put together some sort of um, some learning tools for me. Because I think this is a textbook. I really do. I think it's every student. I think it's, it's not just. Uh, for, I think for high school students, but the thing is that it's so hard, I think, for teachers to find books that really articulate Catholic history within the world history, world civilization within and in, in, in that incorporate how how it is have Catholics have been citizens um, or subjects throughout history. And I think you do a really good job with that. You, you clearly state how we've been involved, our role. Um, our failings and uh, struggles and man, this is just a really great book. Thanks for publishing it. And writing oh, well, it. that's fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for uh, including that in the curriculum. That, that was a secondary goal of it was really, to, wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We, I, it was mainly for the Catholic, the average Catholic layman. Uh, uh -huh. That's, that's who's, who's being targeted here to just try to, give Catholics hope and a true understanding of their history because we've been fed a lot of lies like you've been you just talked about uh there's been a lot of lies not only about our history like that are commonly thrown around even today even by the pope like the crusades the inquisition all this nonsense uh even but even in this modern period there's been a lot of confusion and and sort of oversimplifications of what's really going on in the past 200 years and we i really wanted to write this like for my own children to just say hey here's a book that's gonna I, I just trying to explain everything in in like in an exciting story that you know a 15 mm -hmm. year old would find really fun to read yeah so that's that is a secondary uh a secondary goal of the book so i'm really glad that uh, it's being used and thank you for your your very generous uh uh blurb on on the book as well david thank you <laughs> yeah i remember when i when i was sending it back to you you're kind of like i don't know it felt like you're kind of taking it back by because i did compare this book to city of god um, by um, St. Augustine, just how Timothy does a really good job in his book, and you can find it online anywhere. I know he has a link to it on his website, pointing you back to Amazon, where he has um, uh, Kindle copies and paperback copies. And so it's City of God versus City of Man by Timothy S. Flanders. And so I just really appreciate it how it's not some sort of dry history book. It's you narrate storytelling through explaining history as well and i thought i thought saint augustine did that most famously in city of god he's telling a story a real story but also he's uh real history but also he's telling it as as a as a story so it makes it easy to read it makes it pleasurable to read and it also has an impact on the brain that it, um, it's sort of like music and song when we're reading story, it just has a deeper impact in our in our memory and our conscience. So, yeah, I think that's I fantastic. You did an awesome I, job with that. I'm so glad to hear that, uh, David. It, it's I meant it to be kind of almost like an, a hagiography of the church itself. So okay. Just the glories of of how, what God has done in history. Yeah. Uh, and the story of God in history, the fact that God is Lord over history, and I I attempt to show that in this in this text uh, to really put because history has been co-opted by atheist materialism. So even Catholic historians will just sort of say, well, then this king did this, and then this pope did this. <laughs> right. They don't say, what was God doing? What was God exactly. doing in this period? And I, and I attempt to bring that out just with the saints, and, and how do we interpret things like the uh, when the, the Muslims invaded? 
Well, all the saints understood what happened at that time. They under they had an intuition at, that God was pouring out his wrath on his people. And we see this throughout history in, in the same way that we see it in the Holy Scriptures. We see the same thing going on in the Holy in the uh, the history of the church. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the most beautiful thing. Your last school I was teaching that used this textbook. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's called Light to the Nations. And it does just that. I mean, it's, it's supposed to be like a Catholic history textbook. And it does, you know, it does talk more about Charlemagne than you would read anywhere else, right? And, you know, things like that. But where was God? Where's the providence, right? Where's where's the leading in this? Where's God in this, in this whole history? But what, what, is, what, is, what is the structure of the book? So you're talking about 2,000 years, right? give us give us the outline uh yeah it's basically 2000 years but we do go back to the very beginning with adam and eve so it is uh trying to be a a, a one volume history which tries to simplify as, as much but also without oversimplifying to the point of making things too that are really complex too obscure um that especially like in our modern period we people have people throw around a lot of theories about What's going wrong with the church right now? Some was like, "Oh, it was Vatican II," and others say, "No, it's it's not it's not this implementation." Uh, I say it's actually far more complex than all of those theories combined. In fact, that that part of the book is going to be very controversial because nobody's going to like it. It's not going to make everybody <laughs> anybody happy in their in their okay. theories. Um, but uh, it's the basic structure of the book is um, that we need to see Christ as coming to as the Lord of his throne on earth, which is, which takes place in the soul of every human being, but he saves every soul and then he saves the society. And so this is a, it's really a spiritual history of culture in the fullest sense of the term culture. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And so we're speaking with Mr. Timothy S. Flanders. He is the creator of the meaning of Catholic. Also, you can find his, his, he's done a lot of work as editor over at one Peter five. So check him out there. And Tim, where else can people find you? Are those the main two uh, um, avenues? Uh, yep. Uh, the, so this text is available. You go to meaning of Catholic.com slash city of God. And we have a paperback Kindle and ebook available now. And we will have an audio book as well. Oh, wow. Um, so hardback God willing, but um, it, it's really, it's, um, I'm hoping to get the audio book out, especially because it's really just meant to be the excitement of God's working and, and to give us hope for the situation that we find ourselves in. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on who you're going to have near read or read the book? Is it going to be you or are you going to, um, shop that out? Oh yeah. I have a, I have a reader who did my first book and, uh, he's, he's very good. We've, we've been forming a business partnership, so. Yeah, uh, his name's Michael J. B. He also writes for One Peter Five. Oh, wow, awesome! And so let's work through the book a little bit so we can give our listeners sort of a taste of why I was so impressed with the book and why I think everyone should go out and get a copy, you know, in any format that's uh, most convenient to them. And so I want us to start at a little bit at the beginning um, and open up with talking about the two empires what are the two empires yeah so basically the the first two chapters talk about the context of that this cosmic dominion of satan and his fallen angels over the entire world and that satan is actually ruling through these empires and that's this is how we see that satan works because empire itself is a, an imposition of bloody conquest, conquering other nations and destroying them for the sake of worshiping an antichrist figure. So in the case of the Roman empire, it was Caesar Augustus. And then there was the, and then there's also the Persian empire, the other empire that people don't talk about. That's another aspect of the history that we're missing. Uh, So we have these two different empires, but they also have two different aspects. There's the, uh, they're an empire of death because they are imposing themselves by, by means of bloodshed. But they do so with a justification of freedom. They have their own gospel. Uh, the Roman Empire called itself. They had their own son of God. The Persian Empire had its own king of kings. Um, these are titles that were already in existence before the New, Test- New Testament was written. And so we know the New Testament is actually taking these political terms that existed before Christ 
and restoring them to their rightful owner, Jesus Christ himself. And so Jesus Christ comes to break the power of the satanic empire, which is over the whole world, both spiritual and political. And then it's being ruled through these puppet empires, the Roman Empire, Persian Empire. And he yeah. breaks the power of Satan and plants this mustard seed, which ultimately conquers this empire. <laughs> wow, that sounds like a fascinating story. If I didn't know it's true, I would I, I would definitely be interested in finding out more about this. I like the way you laid that out. And, and Diana Alice, she's commenting on the one of the YouTube streams and she's commenting on, on what we were saying earlier. She says, yes, thank you for writing in a way that makes it easy for people like me to understand emoji, big smiley face. So <laughs> great. Yeah. I, yes. This is just, uh, yeah, this is just for people who love I mean, we all love the, 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 um, stories of the saints. Everybody loves those. And this is just meant to be the story of the Holy church, the bride of Christ sort of as a saint, if you will, and all the saints of that church and how they conquered in all their different eras. And that can give us hope for our own time. Yeah. Yeah. And within those, and within that journey of, of God's providence and his work, what would you, what would you say are some of the most pivotal events in the last 2000 years after Christ that you would say just have just fundamentally, fundamentally changed the, trajectory of human civilization of course the crucifixion and resurrection is the event that that changes everything you have to do something with that 2000 years ago you have to reconcile that because everything changed but post that after that what, what were some of those events do you think just set us on like just a new course that if they would not have happened uh we would be somewhere else well we just celebrated the feast of our lady of guadalupe and one of the interesting thing was that i discovered that there was actually a, a, a we, we just heard the story of that, but there was actually Our Lady of Ephesus, who was really the first time that there was sort of this cult enculturation in a good sense, which transformed a corrupted view of the human person, particularly women, and, cor and corrected it and cleansed it and then converted the whole world. And so there was actually Artemis Ephesia, who was venerated at Ephesus, as a goddess, as a part of this sort of proto-feminist feminism. Mm -hmm. And St. John actually brings Our Lady to Ephesus in the early days as when she was still alive. And then Our Lady is proclaimed as the mother of God at the Council of Ephesus. And all of this is pro God's providential working wow. to cleanse the Roman Empire of this goddess worship and also exalt the dignity of woman. And this is what totally transforms everything. Because the veneration of Mary and, and, and more universally just the, the Christian gospel regarding marriage completely transforms and raises up the dignity of woman to be the queen of the home and the queen of her family, just as Our, Our Lady is, which just tr transforms everything. And it's amazing how this is just a new incarnation of Christ because our lady every time our lady comes christ is incarnate again as it were in a new culture just as it as it was at guadalupe but what's interesting i i discovered this because literally i i heard something from a neo-pagan who actually worships this goddess of <laughs> artemisia and he went to ephesus and dug up all these archaeological ruins and everything and he, his book actually shows inadvertently how much our lady really triumphed in a similar way as she would later do at guadalupe uh, I'm gonna have to go check out that footnote because you footnote his his um his work. Yes, uh, this okay. is by uh, a man named Retfield, who uh, is an archaeologist and and a, a great lover of this ancient goddess because he he thinks that oh, she kind of lives on in Mary as unfortunately, but uh, we hope that he's converted to Christ. But it's it's really quite amazing because this we, we, what we understand is how how Christ comes down and he he uses violence in his own temple and this is cleansing his own throne in the same way as all the saints universally violently destroyed the thrones of demons in order to build a cathedral, which hmm. is a, a a literally the throne of Christ in a society because Christ has an, is enthroned in the Blessed Sacrament. Um, and we see how God really works to transform 
using that mustard seed, as he said in the gospel, because he plants the Christian family and which transforms marriage. It transforms the dignity of woman. It transforms the soul and the family gradually grows into a community and a, a, a the body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ. And this transforms from within the society in every place. And, it, and it's just this wondrous work of grace that yeah. we see in societies. Yeah, yeah. Man, I, I, I think your book is the answer when people want to talk about how, you know, you still have those people today talking about how bad religion has um, been. And they, they don't make the distinction between say Christ in his church versus the people in his church. Cause I think you point out in your book that, yeah, people, there've been some bad Catholics, but just looking, uh, following your book from the beginning to the end, you can just really see the providence of God conforming what men meant for evil for his good. And we're speaking with Timothy S. Flanders. He is the creator of the meaning of Catholic and he's the editor over at one Peter five. He wrote a wonderful book called city God versus city of man you have to get it you have to check it out read the reviews on amazon they're all glowing and if you'd like to speak with timothy flanders about something that's happened over the last two thousand years concerning christ and his church i'm sure he's touched on it in this book and so feel free to call in at 877-757-9424 that's 877-757-9424 so i'm just walking um, Timothy through just some of the highlights of his book so you can see how wonderful it is and um, how I think it important it is how I think it's just going to be a, a classic in for our church so we're, I'm just going to walk up and sort of to baby sort of towards the end of our conversation here just kind of ask him you know where are we where are we now but I'd like to come back to the east and west conflicts um, Rome Constantinople and did, did you, I always found that to be, found that to be more of a, <laughs> there's more politics involved in theology. Nowadays you hear, you know, you can pick up any book from the Orthodox and they talk about how bad the Latins are, everything that we're doing wrong. But was that really the case a little bit over a thousand years ago? Was it really about theology or was there something else going on? Oh, yeah. Well, this is one of the complex things that, that went on, which is still going on. Um, and I was Eastern Orthodox before I came to Rome, and I spent years studying this also on the graduate level. And I found that the, the issue is extremely complex, and uh, there, is, there is a lot of theological stuff, but there's also a lot of politics and culture and economics and all sorts of things as well, hmm. uh, which are critical as well historically now now that like you said now they're not people just talk about this theology but at the time there were huge political and cultural things that were going on and one of the things i discovered in this book that i didn't realize but that seems to make a, a lot more sense than a lot of the histories that i've read is that on a cultural level the roman emperor was the pontifex maximus since caesar augustus and that was a religious uh, a religious office it literally, it means the high priest. It was the high priest of the Roman religion was Caesar Augustus. And this title of Pontifex was con continued to be used by the Roman emperors. And he even had priestly rituals of his own into the 10th century AD. So the Roman emperor of Constantinople, the so-called Byzantine emperor, he was doing these priestly rituals that were inherited from paganism into the 10th century. And wow. this actually explains a lot better one of the central issues, because the question of the first millennium, the, the tension between East and West is really, who really is the Pontifex Maximus in the church? Is it the Pope of Rome or is it the emperor in Constantinople? That's okay. the real issue. Okay. And so the, the emperor in Constantinople is actually appointing, he's deposing or appointing his own bishops of Constantinople. They're basically like his own bureaucrats. Uh, and this comes to a, the climax in the fifth ecumenical council, which is basically a, a contrived council of the emperor Justinian to try to force the Pope of Rome to do his bidding because he's the Pontifex Maximus. And he would mm. literally hunt down the Pope with an army and force him to try to sign documents. And he would do that with everybody. That would, that's what the Roman emperor did as the Pontifex Maximus. And this is the, the, the inner cultural battle that's going on in the first millennium. And, and it's, I'm just so surprised that no historians have really brought this out because to me, I, I think it's, it's absolutely central. Um, and then that's, that's what gets into all these, 
uh, all these theological or cultural or lit ritual um, tensions between East and West, okay. which to a great degree become a pretext for just sort of political tensions. Yeah. So if that's the root, um, how do you deal with that root? Well, it is complex because the, there is a sacred role to be done, to be held by the emperor because we did have a sacred role of the Roman Empire in the West as well. The Holy Roman Emperor, as you mentioned previously, Charlemagne. However, this role by the lay power is not does not have a priesthood. We don't have a sacramental or any kind of religious priesthood. You know, we have a baptism, a priesthood of the baptism, if you will. And but there is a and there is a, a role for the Holy Roman Emperor to play even in resolving church matters at, to a degree, like in the Great Western Schism. But he does not do anything like the Eastern emperors ever did. Like Emperor Justinian was composing his own doctrinal decrees and imposing them on the church. He was composing liturgies and imposing them on the church. To this day, the divine liturgy in the East has the hymn of Emperor Justinian. Now it's perfectly orthodox, so there's no problem with the hymn itself. But yeah. this is just a holdover to this, from this pagan idea basically that the, that the pagan emperor is the high priest and he has this priesthood uh, yeah that's fascinating and your chapter called red martyrs against red bloodshed you state that during the time of saint ignatius of antioch the church was led by the crusading spirit of martyrs the crusading spirits of martyrs and i want you to just talk about that a little bit that terminology because i thought that was very compelling the crusading spirit of martyrs so what's going on yeah in in this in the second century yeah basically this is the the reality that christians are citizens of the city of god and we are at war with the city of man and the, the city of god is the community of all the baptized and the angels all together uh fighting with the city of man to convert the city of man and so the crusading spirit is the war by means of the cross. It's the war of Christ him, himself to dethrone the satanic emperor, Satan himself. The prince of this world should be cast out, our Lord said. Uh, St. John says the reason the Son of God was made manifest was to destroy the work of the devil. And this is the warrior theme, which is universal in the fathers, universal especially in the desert fathers of the spirituality of militancy. And the crusading spirit is fighting by means of the cross. Like the cross is a weapon against the world, the flesh, and the devil. And it means to fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil with no earthly attachment whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And so there's two ways to fight with this crusading spirit. One is the, the spiritual sword in terms of the St. Stephen is the first martyr. He's the witness, and that is the, the red martyr. He is the one who fights with a spiritual sword because he gives his blood and sheds his blood fighting against the world, the flesh, and the devil. And he conquers his enemies by forgiving them because St. Paul obviously is the, you know, the, one of the cooperators of his martyrdom. Um, so this is what conquers and converts the enemies of Christ. Now, ultimately, there's, there is also a temporal sword in Christendom as well. There is the crusade that, as we know it, as we commonly call it, but that's actually a much earlier development than many think. It actually did arise under the Empress Pulcheria in Constantinople in the 400s, was really the first true crusade to fit the description, which is where there was a temporal army fighting on behalf of Christendom and the city of God, not for an earthly kingdom. And that was first done by the Empress Pulcheria, who's a saint. Uh, and it was continued by Emperor Heraclius later on in the 600s as well. And so there is this, this idea of a holy war, but it's a war with no earthly intention. It's solely to secure the rights of the church for souls and society. Okay. 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 That makes sense. Uh, yeah. That, that's, man, you could write a whole book about just that right there. <laughs> that, that's, that, there's a lot to dig into there. And we're speaking with Timothy Flanders. He's the author of the book, City of God versus City of Man. You can find it online. Just type that into your to your browsers. Amazon is a good place to check it out. He has different verses there. He's coming out with also audio book, book which I know many of you like. We got a few comments here in the comment boxes I want to get to before we um, continue. And the producer, Sissel, she put a link. If you're looking on the Facebook 
in the other streams, it looks like the producer Cecil Anderson has put a link to the City of God in in uh, there. So go to our, our pages. You can find a link there if you're struggling. And so Anthony Rodriguez, um, he looks to be a big promoter, um, Timothy. He's saying um, they're talking about your book. And he says, Laura, it's a must buy, in my opinion. And I have not even I'm not even out of the gates of it. Everyone who I know read it said it's amazing. <laughs> so, and Thanks, we have Anthony. another. Yeah, shout out to Anthony. He's one of our uh, supporters and and uh, partners in in the meaning of Catholic. Oh, also, yeah. And uh, can't pronounce the name here. Karundru says, "We know God chose to create lesser creatures to mediate His truth, goodness, beauty, and love to save souls." It seems like the devil parodies this by using creatures to steal souls from God. Did you want to comment on that, Timothy? Is there a parody that you've noticed yeah, in your work? Absolutely. Well, th this is this is of course the wickedness of idolatry, and this mm -hmm. is the use of creatures in a disordered way to offer worship to them in exchange for power. And I think the way that the New Testament really deepens this understanding is that it claims that avarice itself is idolatry because it's the love of money is the root of all evil, says St. Paul. And so this is actually a big uh, running aspect of the history in that we the, the gospel comes to any culture and the idols must be torn down in every culture violently publicly because they are keeping the people subdued to satan saint paul says that uh, they have been kept in fear of death under the empire of death in the in the epistle to the hebrews and so the gospel comes to every culture and the saints come and they preach and then they violently destroy the idols to prove to the people that they have no power by the sign of the cross mm -hmm. but then the idols within our hearts must be torn down in particular and uh, most potently, the idol of money, the idol of avarice. So there's this this deeper idolatry, which the gospel then must must penetrate and cleanse. And economics is a very, very important part that uh, the gospel really cleansed. Uh, it, most most uh, conspicuously, uh, the slave trade is mm. is the way that uh, this is seen most. Uh, conspicuously in the church is the way that the gospel freed the slaves. It actually freed their slave twice <laughs> um, because there was a slave trade that was, it was abolished and cleansed in the early ancient times. And then there was the racist slave trade that was reintroduced mm. because, because the, the Christians, people don't know this, the Arabs, the Muslims had been carrying on a racist trans Saharan slave trade from the year C 800 to 1415 hundred. They've been doing it for, almost a thousand years and they had a racist ideology and Christians succumbed to the idol of money and they yeah. joined the Muslims to, to do this racist slave trade, which was condemned by the popes and, and, you know, Jesuits and Dominicans were all fighting against it for centuries. Um, but nevertheless, the gospel still conquered that slave trade as well. Yeah. And so Christian civilization is the only civilization that's, that's really abolished the slave trade twice. <laughs> Man, that's, that's fascinating. And, Let's come to the United States for a moment as we wrap up our discussion. We're speaking with Timothy Flanders. He is the author of The Meaning of the Catholic. Also, you can find his work at, oh, he's the author of The City of God versus City of Man. But you can also find his work at The Meaning of the Catholic and also uh, 1 Peter 5. He's the editor there now. And so you can check out some of his work there. And, um, oh, yeah, Lisa says in the comm box, David, I haven't been able to attend your live sessions lately. Good to see you. Yeah, thanks, Lisa, for coming back. I haven't been doing many live streams but Cicel, she's um whenever i do the show on wednesday she has the live streams going so thanks for coming in and timothy let's come to the united states for a moment i've always been fascinated by the carols and the calvers but particularly you know the john carroll um talk a little bit about that coming into the united states and their impact on early catholicism here yeah absolutely so it's another complex history because it's kind of like the american revolution on the one hand, is a conservative anti-Catholic revolution on the one hand, compared to France, France, Quebec, New France, Quebec gets its own Catholicism. Nevertheless, the Carols actually fight on the side of the Patriots 
and they actually win more rights for Catholics as a result of the American Revolution. So it's kind of like a, a American Revolution is both good and bad for Catholics. Um, and so the Carroll family, so going back to the Calverts first, the, the colony of Maryland in the United States was founded by a Catholic refugee from the Protestant England. He was just trying to find some peace to celebrate the mass. Uh, you know, see, he was he was just trying to get along with the Protestants because he knew that in, in Protestant England, I mean, he could be denounced and destroyed. And he could be killed. So he was just trying to get along with the Protestants. So he's just like, hey, let's just get along. Let's not be too Catholic, too upfront about it. But he happened to have a Jesuit on his ship. And the Jesuit said, no, we got to have a public mass immediately and give thanks to God. So. He has uh, the other, and he goes off and converts the Indians and, and baptizes this uh, Indian emperor and all this great stuff. Um, yeah. But the Calvert really want to go along to get along with the Protestants. They mm. don't want to make waves. They just want to survive. And this, this spirit has, unfortunately, infected Catholicism in America. And it also ultimately came into the Carroll, the, sort of the Carroll family, in the sense of going along to get along to curry favor with George Washington. And George Washington was a great man, but he wasn't a Catholic. Uh, and, you know, some say he was converted on his deathbed. I think the evidence is dubious, but he was still a great man. He was virtuous. You know, he was sort of like a, you know, enlightenment virtuous guy. And we, we you know, we love him. He's a hero. Um, but the Carols were very much wanted to get what they could, which they got, some, they got the right to build churches, which they didn't have before the revolution. Okay. But there is this still this this spirit of compromise with the regime and don't be mm. too Catholic, too controversial in the public square. Otherwise, the Protestant regime will come after you. And that, that's actually been the history of Catholicism in the United States right there. Um, every time Catholics became too numerous or too influential, the Protestant regime came down on us. And there was all the, always these powerful Catholics who were saying, ah, let's not be too Catholic. And the most famous in the 20th century is John F. Kennedy, who yeah. publicly basically repudiated his whole Catholic faith, which basically is, is a complete um, prediction of Joe Biden. It's, uh, John F. Kennedy did the same thing in principle as Joe Biden is doing now. Uh, and John F. Kennedy did it publicly before he was elected president in the year 1960. I mean, he should have been condemned as a heretic right there, you know, before uh, we, we would have had a lot less problems. But it was an era of optimism. We thought it would work. Unfortunately, it has not worked. And so now we're left to pick up the pieces. But it is it is a complex history because there are some uh, obvious pluses. You know, American the American empire today, the United States, has far more free masses in the whole world right now with the COVID and everything uh, yeah. than many strongly catholic countries like mexico and who would have thought the united states would have more sacraments available per capita than mexico one of the, like pretty much the most catholic region of north america you know um so the america is great but flawed so it's a complex history yeah wow that i, I never even thought about that how that has infected catholicism for the next few hundred years after the carols and the cowards man that, that's that's really fascinating go get timothy's book the city of god versus the city of man where, where, where are we at now in this in god's providence and how you see him leading us where are we at now in this in this story tim well uh the the big moments of darkness in the church's history are what I call the pornocracies. Now, this is a term by historians who refer to the 10th century, the, the so-called pornocracy or the dark age of the papacy, which when there was really corrupt popes, so the Vatican was really corrupt and everything. Um, but there was actually, right after that darkness, there was this huge renewal and revival, which is the glories of the high Middle Ages, St. Thomas Aquinas, right after this huge dark period of, of the church. Uh, the same thing happened with the Protestant revolt. There was a, a very dark period, the Renaissance papacy, very corrupt. Everything was extremely corrupt. And then we have the actual, the Baroque civilization. P another thing people don't realize is that the Protestant revolt was largely a failure. Uh, the, the Catholic counter-revolution, the their counter-reformation, was causing a, a, the renewal of the faith and the expanding of the faith in what, what we call in the book Second Christendom, which is Baroque civilization in Italy, Austria, Spain, New Spain, North and South America, Philippines. These other places are growing Christendom and expanding Christendom. Um, and so I believe that 
we are also in the this sort of third pornocracy. We have all these scandals and all this corruption in our church right now with the hierarchy. But I think that we're actually at the cusp of a great triumph. Uh, that may sound naive, but just read this book. This is the evidence <laughs> of God's working. This is how God works. He he yeah. he he allows as 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 God the Father allowed the Son of God to literally be crucified and die, literally die and be buried. He also allows the church, his body, to in in as literally as it can be, really die and then rise again every time. Mm. Another example is the French Revolution. At, right after the French Revolution, which was a horrible killing of persecution of Christians and, and nuns and priests, there was a massive revival in French Catholicism right after that. It had never huh. been seen in centuries. A massive revival. We have St. John Vianney. We have multiple apparitions of yeah. Our Lady. We have all these people using the new railroads of the, of the 19th century to go on all these pilgrimages. This yeah. huge revival of French Catholicism right yeah. after the darkest period in French history. Right. So I think that we really are at the cusp of a, a huge renewal, but it's going to come from heaven. It's not going to come from all of our planning or anything like that. It's going to awesome. come from the grace of God, and he's going to do it because – Obviously, we can only do, we can do nothing but sin uh, of our own. So. <laughs> awesome. But we'll have to leave it there. That's that's a, that's a great finish. Tim Tim is hopeful, and there's evidence for that hope. So I, I would say that. So thanks again for coming in, Timothy. Everybody go out and get the book, City of God vs. City Man. Thank you for tuning in. I'll be back same time next week, same place, and I look forward to conversing with you again. In between time, you can visit me at davidlgray.info. But until then, until next time, remember... Jesus loves you and is there for you. And live your life like salvation matters. And may the abundance of our Lord's blessings and graces and favors fall upon you and yours. Thank you.